All right, thank you. And uh, welcome everyone. Um, the topic of this discussion, the art of data, is one that I'm really passionate about. Um, for the reason that we're, we are making art. And the longer I'm in this industry, the, the more I see that the business world is really hungry for art. Um, people are tired of interacting with things that are uh, not aesthetically pleasing. The interfaces are frustratingly difficult. And we start merging toward a spot where the aesthetics that we're looking for and the things that are informing our design are not just coming from the traditional fields of statistics and business intelligence, but they're starting to come from uh, other artistic disciplines. And that's what this presentation is really about. Uh, make no mistake, if you work in data visualization, then you are working in art and you are an artist. Uh, we are using aesthetic principles to communicate an abstract idea through imagery. And uh, that serves as a very rudimentary definition of art itself. Sometimes that imagery isn't visual, but in our case, it is. So um, I'd be willing to argue that all of us that are working with Tableau or working in data visualization are artists. And this presentation aims to talk a little bit about uh, some specific disciplines and theories that can help us think through this. So as we move through this presentation, I'm not going to be talking about anything new. Uh, but sometimes a new way of thinking about things can help advance how we approach certain problems. It can help advance how we think and evaluate uh, new materials and things that we see. Uh, so we're going to draw from Lorca's El Duende, which is an art theory, and then we're going to cover uh, three different techniques that uh, I think are really common in other art forms, uh, specifically in dance and poetry, that I think can be a way to think about and enhance our own designs. So a new paradigm, Lorca's El Duende. Um, a lot of times we talk about storytelling and storytelling's good, but there's a lot of things out there where it feels like we're trying to force a story onto something and really the data is just coming together to present a coherent argument. And there's not really a full story. There aren't characters, there aren't real events uh, in the data. And so I think sometimes having other paradigms to think about our design and what's meaningful and what's powerful can be helpful. And, I, and, and Lorca's El Duende, uh, was something that I saw early on and made me think about data visualization as a practice. So thinking about uh, Duende, um, is it's good to think about uh, the previous paradigms, right? So Lorca talks about uh, the angel and the muse and El Duende. Um, <clears throat> in, his, in his essay, uh, he talks about the angel as inspiring artists simply through beauty. And he talks about the muse as inspiring artists through intellect, this sort of eureka aha moment. But the Duende is a little bit different. So the picture here is represented as a little goblin-like creature um, or elf. Uh, often they are mischievous and like to cause pranks or little problems. Um, and it's this idea of struggle as, as art. Um, art that comes out of something that we as artists are struggling with. And this quote here that I love from his essay, the Duende delights in struggling freely with the creator on the edge of the pit. Angel and muse flee with violin and compasses and Duende wounds. So moving on to art, before we get into data, uh, Lorca says dance and poetry are ripe for Duende, um, but notes that Duende can happen in any art and doesn't restrict them. Uh, and a couple of pieces that I would say capture Duende uh, are Giselle as a ballet <clears throat> and uh, the universe original motion picture soundtrack is a poem by Tracy K. Smith. So Giselle <clears throat> uh, was first performed in 1841. And if you want to think about struggle in art, this literally deals with the struggle of life and death, as well as love and the ability to transcend uh, the, the natural world and move from death into life and back and forth. Uh, and Tracy K. Smith's poem, I'm not going to read it all now for the sake of time, but I highly encourage you to find it on poetryfoundation.org. Uh, it's a lyrical poem, and it deals with how big and chaotic our universe is, and, and relative to that, how small uh, we are and where we fit. <clears throat> Thinking about Duende as a data paradigm, right, is... It means that we're struggling with something and that that struggle allows us to see things differently than we would see before. So, you know, from the most obvious standpoint of, oh, I didn't know that when we show executives business dashboards, but uh, sometimes it can be even a little bit more playful than that. 
<clears throat> um, this visualization you're seeing here uh, is is purely an abstract play that I had, um, just uh, messing with the data and seeing what I could see uh, differently. And so, what you're seeing here is a, a whole bunch of dots. Um, this was a anniversary present for my wife uh, because I'm a nerd and I like to make art and I like to make art from data. And so, I made this for our seventh anniversary, and hence the seven rings that you are seeing. Uh, each dot, there's there's uh, two dots for each day uh, that we've been together. So a dot for her and a dot for me. And you can see, if you look closely, these dots move apart and move together, uh, kind of indicating our relationship. Uh, not, that, <clears throat> not that we've had these struggles that pulled us apart, but because when two people walk, right, the, the paths aren't always along the same line. They're not always moving together. And so I took these days and I randomized where these dots would fit on a scatter plot. And then I connected them through, through these rings. And it made me, this whole process really made me think about relationships in a new light. It made me think about uh, how there's cyclical patterns um, and you know seeing it in this visualization also made my wife and I think about the rings on a tree and the growth that happens through there and, and how these paths get bigger over time and just like rings moving out further and further uh, that sort of growth that happens um, you know there's it's one thing to talk about this is our seventh anniversary but it's another thing to struggle with the data behind that sentence and to start thinking about it in new ways and new patterns that are completely abstract and aren't designed to simply give us an accurate number as a more practical version um, <clears throat> This one uh, I made in response to a, a quote from a United States politician who said, so maybe rather than getting that new iPhone they just love and they wanna go spend hundreds of dollars on, maybe they should invest in their own healthcare. They've gotta make those decisions themselves. And I'll be honest with you, uh, a number of years ago, I would have agreed with that statement. And back then I thought, you know, a few hundred dollar hospital bill was expensive. Um, but and then I got a chronic condition and I learned how expensive these sorts of things can be. Um, and, and there's a struggle in there, right? A struggle of, I thought one way and I got this data, which was my own claims and started thinking about things differently. And this visualization you're seeing here takes his comment and compares that to the cost of a medication, one medication for one year. And the struggle that came out of this actually led to a change in my career pathway where I've decided to work in an organization who has the mission of, of improving the quality of care while reducing the cost of care in the United States. So uh, there was that struggle and the process of seeing this data and reconciling it with my previous beliefs has, has had this long-term impact on my life. So the question is, you know, how do we get to this Duende? Uh, Duende isn't an artistic technique. It's, it's a way to think about and appreciate it, but technique can enhance the themes of our work to draw that Duende out. So we're gonna talk about structure, cadence, and drama. That first piece is structure. So taking a couple examples of this uh, from our two artistic pieces, uh, artists often use structure to call out those themes and as an audience orient us toward those themes. Uh, structure often positions us uh, where we are relative to the piece. So an example from Giselle is lighting and stage position as a structure uh, can help us distinguish the living from the dead. So in this picture you're seeing, the people in the back are, are not as well lit. And then there's also this implication of uh, people that are off stage of being in this world of the dead and then they can walk onto the stage and suddenly they're in the world of the living. So this idea of the struggle of moving back and forth, living to the dead, all based on the stage position and the lighting. And in Tracy K. Smith's poem, she uses couplets, which are uh, a very traditional method of poetry structure, right? Two lines, uh, break, two lines break, two lines break, uh, but couplets often have a very traditional rhyming structure and she breaks away from that. So it's this idea of this structure calling out this metaphor of structure in the universe, but also this kind of chaos and breaking away from those patterns and it, it emphasizes uh, in my reading the cacophony and the overwhelming nature of the universe. And looking at that in our visualizations, Structure can provide our users with visual metaphors, right? So we think about our visualizations and the entire dashboard that we might build in Tableau. Uh, the overall structure can help communicate a metaphor, even, 
even below an explicit level. So an example that you're seeing here was one based on some Makeover Monday data and Makeover Monday is something you've heard consistently in the Fringe Festival presentations. Uh, but up at the top, we have this bar chart over time. And I chose a bar chart instead of a line chart because it kind of looks like a New York City skyscraper uh, <clears throat> landscape, that horizon that you might see. And then the majority of the data is underneath. So it's this idea of rats and underground, you know, underneath these skyscrapers. Uh, and then these dark colors, this gray and black, again, kind of calling back to this New York City and rats underground nighttime uh, set of themes to really draw that out and make that a little bit more apparent in the design itself to the user. Thinking about cadence as, as another technique, and music in music, cadence has a specific definition, but that's not what we're going to talk about today. I want to use more of the literature definition, which is kind of like the flow when you're reading a piece, you know, how does a sentence move you along the page? And it's very closely tied to rhythm. And movement can pull us through a piece and also communicate a sort of metaphor to us. Uh, in Giselle, there's this idea of the dancers and they move together. And when they move together, it's this idea of two people in a very, uh, a very tight relationship. And then something happens and that relationship might struggle and those two dancers move apart, right? And then you start to lose, uh, lose the movement together. And one dancer will move in one way and almost to a different beat than the other dancer. And that communicates uh, some sort of a separation or, or a break or drama in the relationship. And Tracy K. Smith's poem here, I do want to read this part out loud. She'll speed us up and slow us down through patterns of alliterations and stress syllables, so similar sounds. Uh, so the first track still almost swings, hi-hat and snare, a few bars of sax the stratosphere will singe out soon enough, right? These patterns can speed us up and slow us down and kind of gets this idea of the universe, right? There's explosions that, that created everything and then things start to whittle down and slowly move away from each other. And then perhaps another explosion, you know, our universe always forming itself and reshaping itself, right? This movement through the poem, speeding us up and slowing us down can have a pretty dramatic impact. And in our dashboards and our visualizations, the way a user reads through the dashboard can also have a very strong impact. So what you're seeing here is <clears throat> uh, another Makeover Monday data set on volcanic eruptions. And the area at the top, this line chart of eruptions over time serves as a natural header, this orange versus the darker colors. And again, that orange and dark serving as a visual metaphor for volcanoes. Uh, but up at the top, it kind of gets the shape of a volcano, right? This peak up on the right-hand side. And then as the user scrolls down, it's almost like they're drilling into the volcano as they're drilling deeper and deeper into the data and getting further insights. And then for moments where I want the user to pause, right, the, the visualizations are oriented horizontally as opposed to the vertical scrolling, which makes the user you know, stop, investigate the data. There's a break in that natural flow to get them to pay attention to specific points, right? So all of these things come together to orient the, how the user is navigating their way through this visualization. And <clears throat> all calling back to this overall metaphor of volcanoes and eruptions and explosions. Drama, the last technique we want to talk about, um, that's what pulls the audience into the art piece and also tells them what the value of this art piece is. How should I feel? What should I think about this? So Giselle will enhance particular moments uh, with music, lighting, choreography, and especially pauses, right? So this is a very powerful scene you're seeing a picture of with this long pause. Uh, sometimes this pause will make us kind of sit on the edge of our seat and wonder what's supposed to be happening. You know, what's, what's the emotional impact of this? And, and when they pause, that tells us that this is something pretty important. And Tracy K. Smith will use uh, particular words with punctuation and line breaks and even sentence length uh, to bring us into the theme. So uh, on this third stanza there, the sixth line uh, in this poem, you see this so much for us. It's a really short sentence relative to a lot of the rest of the poem. And it's the first time we as readers are, are referenced. We as humans 
in relationship to this universe. It's a very impactful moment. And Tracy K. Smith kind of highlighted that by giving us a very short sentence. So right between two pauses that make us stop and think about that. And in our visualizations, we can also try to look for drama. Our word choice and our design elements can create this emotional impact. Um, <clears throat> sometimes when we're building visualizations, we can hedge a little bit too much toward this objective analyst. And a lot of times that's very, very important. But other times we're trying to get that emotional response. We're trying to communicate the power of something. So hyperbolic and metaphoric word choices are ways we can create drama. So I said poetry is dead here, right? That's not accurate. Poetry is not alive, so it can't die. Uh, the more accurate statement would have been poetry readership is on the decline. And that's not emotionally engaging for most people. Uh, using this hyperbolic and metaphoric word choice is much more powerful. And then I also really pulled out bolder colors. Uh, the contrast is, is a bit heavy on this, but I really wanted this idea of something that is alive. And a lot of these uh, dot plots have lines connecting, trying to show a lot of movement, right? Poetry is not this, this thing that's static, but it's moving. And so all of these things can, can pull a little bit of drama in there, brighter colors, bolder colors, uh, hyperbolic word choices, moving visualizations that appear to have some sort of movement in them. All of those can create some sort of drama. So the question is, those are the artistic techniques, but in the first place, how do we get to data Duende, right? And if Duende is the struggle, uh, then we have to struggle with our data, but it can be playful and it can be fun. So one of the things that I really wanna push is that we should be willing to experiment. Um, best practices are really important, especially when we're building dashboards for business, but a lot of times accuracy isn't that ultimate goal and we should be willing to step outside of those realms of best practices and experiment and try new things and see what happens with the data when we present it in a way that we're not looking for accuracy. When we start looking into the realm of, you know, what's another abstract way I can present this, we start getting into an area where maybe we can create new visualizations. And this is how we get visualizations that can later turn into something that is more accurate and does work in a business scenario. So what you're seeing here are two visualizations that I paired together, kind of looks like almost like an owl's eyes. Um, <clears throat> they're both from the same data set, which is a measure of the size of beehives in the United States. And uh, this is different than the Makeover Monday data set that was from Honey Beast. Uh, but what you're seeing on the left is a simple scatter plot. The, the gray rings on the outer edge uh, represent the average size of a beehive uh, five years ago. And then the dark gray ring in the center is the average size of a beehive just two years ago. And then the yellow ring uh, that's a little bit bigger is the average size of a beehive last year. And you get this idea of a swarm with all of these dots moving back and forth. Um, it, it really does call to mind a bunch of little bees. And on the right hand side, I took that same plot, but I made lines to connect it. And so now you have a lot of movement in this. Uh, neither of these am I going to look at it and say, I know exactly what the size of a beehive was over time. It's not a line chart. It's not a bar chart. It's not going to give me that level of accuracy. But what it is going to allow me to do is think about this and see this in potentially a different way because it's abstract and it's, it's a little bit more engaging, uh, kind of draws me in and wants me to think about it, right? It's this, this idea of play uh, that, that got me to this different way of thinking about this. So what I really encourage people to do that uh, found any of this interesting is uh, to send ideas to me on, on ways that you play. Um, I really call out the importance of inspiration from the other arts, right? So uh, we talked about poetry here. We talked about dance. Um, inspiration is, is critical. And I've started reaching outside of data visualization for my inspiration. So at my desk are two books of poetry. Uh, that I always have there. One's my favorite and one's whatever current book of poetry I'm reading. And if I struggle with a dashboard, even if it's a business and executive dashboard, uh, I, will, I will stop and I will pick up one of those books and read a few poems and then return to the dashboard. And usually that little element of inspiration can be incredibly helpful. Sometimes I'll find techniques 
that I can find an analogy for in my design. Other times I just need to hear from another artist. I need to talk to another artist uh, to get my brain working. So I'd love to hear from uh, all of you what your ideas for inspiration are when you're designing a dashboard or a visualization. Where do you go? What's important to you? Um, and how do you look to the other arts for inspiration? Uh, you can find my uh, information there. I'm active on Twitter under the handle at data poetry, but there's a number of other things in there that you can find me on. Uh, don't hesitate to reach out. And I look forward to hearing uh, any of your thoughts or ideas about inspiration from the other arts. Uh, thank you so much for your time. And I'm glad to have presented at the Fringe Festival.